Not all vulnerabilities are created equal, and just because you can find them doesn't mean you fully understand them. In this video, we are pulling back the curtain on threat and vulnerability management programs, really digging in, explaining why they're nuanced and why they're an ongoing effort, and some of the challenges that you can encounter trying to implement a threat and vulnerability management program at your organization. Coming up. Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. So recently we did the build a vulnerability scanner on a Raspberry Pi video and you know, the community loved it. I loved it. Raspberry Pi projects are a lot of fun, but two members of the community, Javier Vega and Darren Young, offered up some really great points. Just scanning gives you the visibility into your network's assets, right? And but this is only like, you know, a, a small portion of a threat and vulnerability management program. It's really just kind of reconnaissance, if you will, of what is going on in your environment. Now, a couple things that you need to know right off the rip. And, and by the way, just as an aside, as you're going through this video, I really want you to take uh, note and thought around the things that we're pointing out on what are challenges and what is the reality. Because in a textbook, uh, or in a, in a class setting when you're talking about these things, all conditions are always perfect. You're never dealing with like personalities. You're never dealing with misconfigurations and stuff. It's always like perfect situations. But what I'm going to be sharing today is like reality and a lot of the challenges that you can encounter. So right off the rip, you run your scanner across your whole network and you've got a bunch of vulnerabilities. Okay. First things first, your scanner may not be reporting on everything, right? So Network devices, ESXi uh, chassis, like um, oddball, like, you know, some IoT webcam, stuff like that, like, no, like non-traditional things. Sometimes scanners don't know how to read them or they misclassify them. Um, so just right off the rip, your scanner may not see your entire environment well. Okay, second of all, let's just say it does see your entire environment. It may, because you're not using uh, authenticated scans, meaning it has a admin account to log on to the machine, the box, the operating system, whatever, um, you may not be getting a full list of all the vulnerabilities for that particular system, right? Or uh, you have an, uh, an authentic authenticated scan, but you know, you're not actually see, like you are logging in and getting access to the box and scanning it, right? but maybe an unauthenticated scan could see it a little bit better. I, I always run just authenticated scans when I can. But again, getting back to these uh, kind of unusual devices, um, you don't typically log into like a, uh, a networking switch or router um, with, those, with those authentication credentials. At least I haven't seen that in the past. So you're going to have some kind of blind spots or gaps in what your total picture of vulnerabilities are on your network. Okay. So, so that's the first thing. So there's one of the challenges. Another challenge is let's say you scan all the boxes, right? And you find all these vulnerabilities. Well, people can install applications, right? Third-party apps onto machines, right? Like, you know, Adobe, you know, uh, Flash, like was the Bane, Java, all uh, right? So sometimes scanners can't see that. The scanners are only looking at the operating system and kind of the network um, configuration, right? Are there listening ports? What is listening, etc.? So you could have really nasty, vulnerable software uh, running on a box. You could have software that's just completely inappropriate, not vulnerable, but like it's a uh, team viewer or log me in or something like that, right? So those things would also be vulnerabilities, but the scanner may not see that, okay? So it's not reporting that you have an old version of Flash running on a machine. Now, some scanners will see it, right? So it's not, you know, a complete uh, blind spot across all uh, scanners. But, but just know that there is software that is not operating system that scanners cannot see sometimes, right? So this is why uh, an information security program has to be comprehensive. You have to have rules around what software can be brought in, configuration management on what software can be installed, permissions on who can install it, when can they install it, who's going to maintain it, who owns it, etc. right? So these are all pieces of an information security program. Another thing that's worth noting is some vulnerability scanners, the, the Raspberry Pi one that we created is a network-based scanner, right? So we have our appliance and it scans across the network. There's also agent-based vulnerability scanners, for, for lack of a better term. And basically you put agents on all your endpoints 
and they scan the machine itself and push the data back to a centralized management console. Now this is great for performance, especially when you have large environments. Um, the agent can do a lot more, um, have a lot more visibility into the host, right? We're talking about the software, like it might be able to capture exactly what software is installed or removed, report it out. Um, <clears throat> So, so you might think, okay, Jerry, so well, like, let's just do agent-based all over the place. A couple things. One, maybe agent-based one costs more than what your budget is allowed for, right? Because buying one scanner is one scanner. Buying a scanner that has agent licenses is, is different, right? So then we get into money. The other thing, and this is way more frequent and way more often uh, the challenge, if you will, is with agent-based anything. I don't care if it's a vulnerability scanner or if it's an antivirus thing or if it's a... Um, MDM solution, whatever, whatever it is, whatever it is, if it's agent based infrastructure, IT, that side of the house is going to push back and say, this is a, this is a performance impact. I, we can't have it. It is a pain in the butt. Uh, also, you're asking us, IT, to install this as part of our load. Um, so you get into a challenge where you're relying on other departments, other groups in, uh, uh, to help you achieve your goal, right? And this is going to be a common theme throughout uh, information security. But you, you run into this situation where agents aren't being um, consistently installed on machines. A machine gets reloaded with an old image that doesn't have the agent. That's gone, right? Like you, you, with agent-based, it's much more uh, difficult to manage unless, again, part of an information security program, you go to the next level and you have some type of uh, you know, configuration check, network, network access control that looks at the machine before you give it an IP address when it gets on the network and says, is this agent installed? That's a much more advanced control. Um, it costs money to implement that control, and it's definitely not something you're going to have threat and vulnerability in place before uh, you get NAC in, in place, okay? Another kind of uh, challenge that you're going to encounter is getting... Uh, vulnerabilities closed. Again, going back to needing to depend on IT to help you achieve your goals. We in information security, we don't go patch a machine. We don't reboot machines. We don't operate in maintenance windows, right? So we collaborate and coordinate with IT, but we don't touch the machines typically, right? So you need to get and win over and encourage IT in order to put these uh, patches on or these change these configurations, right? So that can be a challenge because they have to test these patches and sometimes these uh, maintenance windows are short and they have to get their job done and your information security job takes a back seat, right? So this is where culture, governance, tone at the top really becomes important because you need to have the uh, influence and the buy-in from leadership to make that a priority for IT versus you trying to make it a priority for IT, okay? Also, sometimes when you add patches, uh, for example, uh, the patch breaks some business service or breaks the box itself and you have to roll the patch back. So now you can't patch it and you've got this open vulnerability. So what do you do? Now you need to think creatively, like, can we move the box? Can we put network controls in place on the box? Can we achieve the same goal, business goal, using a different method? Or do we just have to accept this risk? And, and is that risk acceptable enough? Like you, you as an information security person have to communicate and understand what the risk is so you can advise the business on whether or not, um, well, just advise the business so they can make the decision whether or not to actually uh, accept it. Before we get into the vulnerabilities of a final uh, you know, area of concern or, or thing that's a reality that you should be aware of are false positives, right? So sometimes a scanner will scan and say this box has, you know, whatever, this vulnerability, right? It's, it's, it's vulnerable to uh, code red or blue keep to use two colored um, vulnerabilities, right? Or wanna cry or what, whatever, it doesn't matter, right? And it says you need to address it. It's a critical vulnerability. Well, when you look at the box, it doesn't have that, that vulnerability. It's, it's a false positive. It is not true. The machine is not vulnerable to that weakness. Vulnerability scanners are not perfect, okay? They're not silver bullets. They're not, they're not perfect. Each one has its own kind of challenges and stuff like that. And sometimes they, they misfire, right? And they, they, give you, they report a false positive. So just be aware that you can't take the results coming out of the box as 
uh, you know, canon. You need to validate and verify and then ensure that they are actually um, true vulnerabilities. Okay, now let's take a minute and actually talk about vulnerability criticality, okay? So if you remember in the video, another thing that happens is when you scan a box, and let's just say there's no false positives, and let's say that it's scanning it and getting everything it's supposed to, it's gonna come back with a list of vulnerabilities. Those vulnerabilities are going to have different levels of criticality. Criticality meaning how bad is it, right? So critical is really bad, high is a little less bad, medium, low, informational, as you can imagine. These values are based on a CVSS score, which is Common Vulnerability Something Score. Okay, I, I, I should have looked before I, before I hit play, but uh, or record. But anyways, oh, Common Vulnerability Scoring System Calculator. So let's look, just look really quick at a vulnerability. Okay, so this is the National Vulnerability Database managed by NIST. This is a U.S. government resource. This is CVE 2019-0708, which is Blue Keep, which was a Microsoft Remote Desktop vulnerability. The way it works is CVE is, um, I think, common vulnerability enumeration, maybe. It, it's basically the preface to the vulnerability. So when someone, like security researchers, find a, a real vulnerability and report it to the vendor, it gets a CVE. And like having a CVE is, is really like a great, like it's one of my personal life goals is to have a CVE uh, tied to my name. The second part is um, usually the, it's not usually, it's the year that it was discovered. And then uh, the other number is just the incremental. So this was the 708th vulnerability entered into the CVEs in, or into the NVD in 2019. Okay, you can see there's gonna be a description, all this other stuff. Here's the important thing. This score right here, 9.8, the highest you can have is a 10. Right, 10 is the worst. Based on the score, it's a 9.8. This, so this is like really, really bad. You need to get this sorted out, okay? The vulnerability scanner is gonna report, hey, you've got this vulnerability and here is the criticality. That criticality is based on the, the CVSS score, right? Okay, but, and, and okay, so then what is that CVSS score based on? This is the calculator that they use to get that number, okay? And it looks messy because I'm all zoomed in, but basically here are the qualifiers. How easy is it to attack? Can you attack it from, from the internet basically, or do you have to physically be right there at the box? Right? How complex is it? Do you have to have a PhD in cyber operations or can you just be um, you know, new to computers? Does it require privileged access, right? Do you have to be an admin? Because sometimes you have to chain these um, attacks together in order to execute them, right? Does the user need to interact uh, through the GUI, right? Or through the front end, right? Is it, or is it completely silent? Um, what's the scope? Um, I'm not familiar with what scope is, but uh, metrics, right? You know, there's our CIA uh, security objective metrics. How, how bad is it? Is it, you know, is it compromise all confidentiality? Is it a denial of service attack, right? We've got some temporal scores here. Like, like is, is there an exploit in the wild or is there a proof of concept developed or is this just a vulnerability, right? If there's a exploit in the wild, it's way worse than if there's no uh, proof of concept or anything like that, right? That's why it's temporal because as soon as vulnerabilities come out, people start working on exploits, right? How easy, like, is there remediations available? Like, did the vendor release a patch? Um, is there confidence in how it's being, like, what's being reported? Okay, so I really just click through and pick some, and you can see that it's giving um, these overall scores. So the, the one I just made up had an overall score of 5.9 uh, with the base score at 5.1, and then the, the um, temporal score bumping it up to 5.9. Okay, so this is this is basically how those values are kind of calculated. Okay, so now hopefully you understand like where those um, vulnerability scores come from and what the criticality is. Now, why it's important to understand that is so you can define where that score came from. Now let's talk about your environment, right? You really need to understand the vulnerability to your environment, right? So this one that we were just looking at was Blue Keep. Well, if you uh, have discovered Blue Keep as a vulnerability using your scanner in your environment, that's great that you found it, let's fix it. Now, fixing it, again, you can't just fix everything all at once. There's no magic button that you can push. You need to get IT to help you. It needs to be typically during maintenance windows. Um, it could be an emergency patch if you really think it's bad, but you better be ready to def defend that or maybe lose some political capital. So what you need to do is look at a couple things. One, where is... Where's the affected machine? Is it internal to the network? 
Is it a critical system or is it just like a lab system? Is it, can you access it from the internet? Can you remote in and get to it? How many user accounts can access it, right? Like you need to, like if the machine were to get compromised, right? Someone gets in there, how bad is it, right? Would you detect it? Do you have an EDR solution running on it? Are you checking for, uh, you know, remote connections, right? Which is how Blue Keep would basically allow someone to push right through. So all this to say, you need to really understand what, the vulnerability is obviously right and how bad it is and why it, why the score is what it has but then you have to qualify it within your environment to understand how bad is it to us how bad is it at this machine right you could have blue keep on two different machines in your environment and one is we got to stop everything and get this fixed now and it could the other one could be like maybe we'll get it um during our monthly patch cycle right so be be aware of all of that now in order to better understand, um, do we need to patch it immediately, right? You have to have some type of threat intelligence, right? You have to understand, is this being actively exploited? Are threat actors talking about this? Is this um, a, a, a thing? And because it's temporal, you need to be able to know, like you could say today, yeah, it's not really that bad, but then tomorrow it is actually, you know, bad. Like there, there is. So there's a bunch of different, different threat intel. On this channel, we talk about... Um, uh, cybersecurity headlines daily podcast that's really really good uh, but also you can ingest through threat intelligence feeds into your tooling uh, much more you know useful uh, as far as like automating some stuff with your tooling information but really staying informed if, if you if depending on how big your organization is and how many resources you have doing threat intelligence it could just be like a one-man shop where all you can do is you know, read podcast, uh, listen to podcasts, stay informed on threats, subscribe to some like, you know, uh, Microsoft bulletins, Cisco Talos bulletins and stuff like that to stay informed. Or maybe you're a financial services company that has an entire department of threat intelligence analysts who can go on the dark web, who can keep their finger on the pulse of what's going on. So I know that's, that gets deep quickly, but it's basically about if you're going to be doing threat and vulnerability management or talking about it in at work or in an interview or you know professionally with colleagues you need to understand that this this what we've talked about today really is the nuance of why threat and vulnerability is a program and an ongoing life cycle uh, situation instead of just a point and click um, with a scanner uh, just a fun throwback fact for those of you who are still with the <laughs> still listening uh, who are older and worked in the federal space um, to tell you why it can't be a one-shot bullet, there was a thing called Gold Disk back in the day that it was the government made it. You would scan a box, and it had one button that said remediate all vulnerabilities. Like, literally, it was the magic button. And when you pushed it, I don't even know why they put it in there. When you pushed it, it would literally f configure and fix everything on the box, and it would make the box completely unusable. Like, you could always tell who the new guy was because... They would say like, hey, like this machine's busted now. I don't get it. And it's like, did you push the magic button on gold disk? Yeah. Well, there you go. That's why it's you completely hosed it. We have to re-image the machine. Again, don't know why they put that button there, but anyone who is familiar with gold disk knows exactly what I'm talking about. It's probably chuckling a little bit, just thinking back on it. That's going to do it all for this week. Thanks so much to Javier and Darren for their constructive uh, criticism and open discussion around uh, qualifying uh, that a vulnerability scanner isn't just, you know, what you need to know as a, as a professional who's going to be doing threat and vulnerability management. I'm really happy that I got to make this follow-up video. I hope you found it useful. And as you're running your scans, take into consideration some of the things that we talked about today and bring that into kind of your home lab or your or your or even your professional work and, you know, go out there and crush it. So until next time, stay secure.